Thank you very much. And, and you don't need to rush. The dinner, the coffee is waiting for it. Don't worry. <laughs> Everyone is tired, so try not to boil it too much. So this uh, study is actually the part of the, the PhD work of my uh, student, the, the master head. Uh, it's a common work with, which is supported by Total. Uh, to uh, motivate uh, this uh, study, here is a small uh, movie of a uh, test we, we performed in Germany, in this board. So the, the length of the pipe is about 6 meters, so we're making a 4-point bending test. The, the pipe is relative to the diameter, is about 30 centimeters. It's a thick, it's a thick pipe, 22 millimeters. It's pressurized inside, so here the pressure is about uh, 500 bars. And then we make the, the, the bending test. Uh, we have actually two parts which are, which are welded. There's a girth weld, and inside the girth weld, there is some kind of a notch which was machined before, before the test. Um, these uh, kind of tests are used to, within the, the framework of what is called strain-based design of pipelines. That's the kind of stuff that can happen if you have, for example, earthquake, a landslide, and so, and so on. Or even um, a pipelines on the bottom of the sea being dragged uh, by anchors. This can happen. Um, uh, I will play the movie once more. And, um, you will see that we, we have a first step where we bend the pipe uh, here. You can see extensometer, which are here to, to measure uh, the crack mouth opening displacement. Uh, we did an unloading, unloading step, which allowed us to use a replica so to measure crack advance on the crack opening. And then we reloaded the pipe. There was a second unloading. Well, that's the second one. And then at the end, there is burst, and there is actually it's pressurized with water, and you see the water coming out of the, the pipe. Uh, this test was uh, carried out, as I said, in Germany, in Duisburg, at the uh, Salzgitter Management Forschung, uh, with, this, uh, with this device. Uh, the device is equipped with four ivory jacks. You see, it's a very, very big machine, which can apply very high forces. And in, in this presentation, I will try to interpret that test uh, using numerical simulation. It's a finite element based. And I will divide my talk in two parts. Huh? There's a part with plasticity, and uh, the second part will be dealing with a thing. So let's start with the plasticity. We characterize the plastic behavior of the material using a tensile specimen, standard specimen, which we're taking the mid thickness of the, of the plate. Of the, of the pipe, sorry, uh, along the longitudinal and the trans uh, tangential direction. It turns out that this material is isotropic, and the main reason for that is that it's a seamless pipe. Uh, previously, we have been working on UE pipes, and these pipes are made of plates, and they're usually very, very anisotropic. In, in that case, we're quite lucky. We don't need to, to use fancy anisotropic models. For this plasticity is enough. Um, and however, the small problem, that, as I said, the pipe is fairly thick and it turns out that there is a hardness gradient. Uh, so here are the curves we, we obtain on the, the mid thickness, of the, basically the engineering stress and the engineering strain. If we take uh, a specimen, a full thickness specimen, you see that we get uh, a stress level which is higher. This can be confirmed by making the hardness gradient through uh, the, the thickness. You see the, the weld here in the middle. That's the actual position. So there is overmatch, which is OK. Uh, you see that at the outer diameter, the hardness of the material is much higher than the hardness inside the material. There's also a slight increase of hardness on the, the inner diameter. So this is ne it is necessary to, to account for that um, that kind of uh, gradients to get the proper proper simulation. And there was an, another problem. You see, that's the, the setup we used for the, the, the four point bending. So that's the central part with constant moment, bending moment. The, the support here, the yellow supports, are relatively thick. It's about 300 millimeters. So we, we didn't know exactly which uh, was the correct value for the effective lever arm. So we had 
something then it, the average value was uh, 1.6 meters, but it could be my plus minus uh, 30, 30 centimeters. It turns out that the best agreement was obtained with a lower value of the, of the lever arm, and there's a, a large influence of this value on the overall response of the pipe. So if you add these two ingredients, um, the correct plasticity of the great two uh, wall thickness gradient, you get a, a fairly good match. That's the remote strain. That's the bending moment. Uh, here you can see the first only unloading step, the second unloading step, and that's and that's failure. In this simulation, there's no no cracking, so it's just plasticity. You see that because we can we introduce the Luther's plateau in our model, we can uh, model changes of uh, slope at the beginning of the curve. Uh, we, we had another test uh, that they gave us at the uh, uh, which we could use to, to say that it, it was making sense to, to use this adjusted uh, lever hand distance. So uh, now let's move to tube fracture. Uh, so we have to characterize the base material. Uh, we actually characterize both the base and weld, and weld metals. To do that, we use the standard specimen, which are tensile test, various notch bar specimen with a different notch radius, and also a plate strain specimen. Um, so this is to, to study plasticity and a little bit on the on damage crack initiation. Indeed, we wanted to characterize crack growth. So we use both uh, CT specimen and SCNT specimen. You can obviously see that the material is very ductile because the, the cracking opening uh, you cannot measure, but you can see it's fairly, fairly high. Uh, all these specimens are side grooved and we, we measure the crack advance using the uh, loading compliance method. Uh, all these uh, tests for both the base metal, the weight metal, uh, were used to fit a standard Gerson model using conformity and plasticity. So basically we fixed the critical value for the onset of reconnaissance at 5%. The failure of porosity is 25%, and the F0 is fixed according to the chemical composition. That's a very, very low value. It's very low. And then we fit a Q1 and Q2 only. Um, actually, we fit a Q1 and Q2 on uh, notch, notch bars, and that's what, we, that's what we, we get. So plasticity is well described, and the onset of cracking is also uh, well described. In, in this kind of modeling, models, it's also necessary because here we didn't use uh, some uh, regularization techniques. It's also necessary to fit the element height. And to fit the element height, we, we use our, our test with, uh, with crack extent. Uh, so is, here's one. I mean, this, this, in this case, we have a very, very, very good agreement between the simulation and the experiment. And we basically can attend the difference. It's all, not always like that. But uh, the main idea is that we, we make a simulation that closely mimics the experiments. Uh, that means we, we indeed load the specimen, but we also do the unloading as in the test. And we have something to, to mimic. Uh, I must say also that in the case of the SCNC specimen, uh, to measure the crack tip opening displacement and in the city uh, on the CMOD, we use the Exxon double click method. So we have something also to mimic the, the, um, the Exxon double click, double click method. So basically, with the simulation, we generate a load CMOD curve that can be interpreted with the same program as the test. OK? Uh, now, for CT, we use the ISTEM standard. Uh, to interpret or to com make the calculation of the SCT specimen, uh, we use the, uh, the paper of Kravigo and Ruggeri. And in particular, we use the eta function, which is needed to compute uh, the J value from, uh, from this paper. Uh, if, you, if you do that with the XMW method, you can get a very good representation of the CMOD beta A curve. Crack tip opening displacements, delta acre. 
you can see that the values of CMOD and CTOD are very low. That means the crack is really opening like, like that. There's no, the, the angle is very low actually because the material is so, so ductile and ultimately you get the J delta A curve. I mean, all these curves are similar. Basically, if you get the proper CMOD force curve, you will get these curves correct. Okay, so we have fitted the model and we try to apply now to the full size scale, scale uh, full size uh, test. We try to simulate cracking. In fact, we have inserted two defects: one in the weld metal, one in the base metal. So that's the crack in the in the weld metal after complete failure, and that's the crack that was in the base metal. So we, we just uh, wanted to have a crack in the base metal to, to play with the model. And here you can, you can see the two tips we use to measure the opening displacement. This uh, uh, green stuff is uh, the uh, dough we use to make the replicas. And the initial crack is, is around here. Here is actually the, the actual the geometry of the defect. It's a shallow notch defect. It's only four millimeters deep. Uh, that's what they are interested in, a uh, total shallow, shallow defect. OK, so uh, in the simulation, we use the, uh, that's the number of linear hexahedron we use. That's half a million degrees of freedom. So here you have the overall bending of the central part of the pipe. The crack is here, so it's hard to see anything. And here you have a, a view of crack at once on the field, the stress field ahead of the ahead of the crack. Uh, indeed, I removed the mesh; otherwise, everything would be black. Because there are so many, so many uh, So here you have on this on this graph the the removed strain. CMOD, the crack advance. Uh, the experimental data for the CMOD is this curve, and the blue dots are our simulation. Uh, in, so we think it's quite, uh, quite a good agreement. Here we have the first unloading step, and you see that the silicon replica for CMOD exactly reproduced the, what was measured with the double tip method. So it was one way to check that the double tip method was okay. Uh, the, um, the red curve here is the crack advance, and this the triangle here is the silicon re replica we made, so we have a good match. There was a second unload here, and there's no data point because the, the people in, uh, in this boat, they were somehow not allowing us to do the measurements and to do the, the replica because they were afraid that the pipe may, might burst when we were doing this, although we have decreased the internal pressure. And actually, they were somehow true because we are very close to finding failure. Uh, that's the curve. Here you have the bending moment as a function of the um, strain. And here, the, uh, the crack advance. Here's final failure. I mean, the, the calculation was we were not able to carry out the calculation up to uh, leakage because it's too many elements to, to remove. But you see that in this area, the crack growth rate becomes very, very high and very close to the uh, figure. Okay, and um, so here are some conclusions. So the local approach to fracture, in that case, the GTM-based model was used to interpret that full-size uh, uh, test. And the, this kind of modeling could possibly be used to uh, analyze the potential defects, small defects or complex defects in pipes. Uh, it could also be used to generate the failure assessment diagram or, or to compute crack driving forces which are used uh, to the design of pipes. The main drawback is that these calculations are very, very long. Uh, for instance, in, um, the main reason for that is not the degree of the number of degree of freedom, which is high, but not too, not too high, it's reasonable. It's the fact that there are many, many, many elements in the calculation have shown more than 5,000 elements have been removed to grow the crack, and we, far, we, move, and we are far from leakage. So we'll work on that to improve that kind of simulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you.